Nemo Radio is on the air. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C. Closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! All right, welcome back to another episode of Nemo Radio. So excited to bring you this guest, this interview. You are going to be, as soon as you hear the name, you're going to know, okay, I know who this is. So all I have to say, three words, duct tape marketing. That's all, that's all I need to say, John. The rest, they just take over the show. But for those of you who have been living in a cave the last 20 or 30 years or have never ventured into the marketing and business worlds, John Janch is joining me today. He is a small business marketing speaker, marketing consultant, best-selling author of Duct Tape Marketing, The Referral Engine. We're going to talk about his latest book, The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur. Welcome to the show, to the podcast, John. Oh, thanks for having me, John. So I want to start with something a little different. I, I was snooping around your LinkedIn profile because I'm a LinkedIn guy, as you may or may not know. <laughs> and uh, it piqued my interest. Uh, I want to start with a little bit more of your backstory. So I see that you graduated the University of Kansas in 1982. You missed Danny Manning and the Miracles by about six years, right? Before the glory days. How, well, how I, was I, I, I was there for the championship that, that particular year. And I, actually, the final was in Kansas City. It was the last time. Oh. And, and I'll, just, I'll just tell you what a special day that was. The Royals' home opener was in the afternoon. Uh, and then I went to the final game uh, where they won that, that championship. Uh, it was in uh, Kemper Arena in Kansas City uh, that evening. And it just all coincided with my birthday that year. Wow. That, that's like... <laughs> You should have just retired your sports fandom at that point. It wasn't good. And then the Chiefs win. I know you're a Chiefs fan. And so that's, you're living large. I, I have to go back to 1987 as well. That's when the Minnesota Twins won a World Series. And it's been barren here since then. So it's it's been a rough run for us. But but I want to hear more about your professional journey. And as we talked off air, you know, my audience is going to relate a lot to you. I've got business coaches, consultants, small business owners, many of whom are kind of starting out, you know, trying to build that that business that you have. And I have to assume, John, you just didn't just descend from on high and have all the answers and have no struggle. So can you take us through the early years and, and how all this led into what you're doing today? Yeah, so I haven't done a lot lot um, in terms of jobs. I had a uh, uh, right out of college, worked for an ad agency for about five years and really just kind of wanted to do my own thing. I thought, well, this isn't really that hard. And with with no plan or uh, anything jumped out and I knew I could hustle work. And so I picked up some projects uh, under kind of the heading of, of marketing and, um, and, you know, just, just, uh, you know, started doing things and building things and learning things. And I got a couple small business clients and I really enjoyed working with them. Um, but I also found them to be the most frustrating uh, because they didn't, you know, have the, the, you know, they had the same problems really as much larger organizations, but never the same budget or, or, even, or even attention span, you know, for that matter. Um, so I decided at some point that what I was going to have to do in order to, to work with small business owners was that I was going to have to create a very systematic approach where I could walk in and say, here's what I do. <laughs> here's what you do. Here's uh, you know, the results we hope to get. Here's what it costs, you know, wanted or not. Um, and to my surprise, um, what I think I accidentally tapped into and in trying to solve my frustration was that um, the, probably the greatest frustration with small business owners still today, and maybe even getting worse, is it's really hard to buy marketing services as a small business. Uh, I, I just spoke with somebody this, this morning, and they, they have a, an SEO person, a pay-per-click person, a content person, a person that does their website, a person that writes emails for them, and they're all you know different, five different companies you know trying to put this together. And you know he was just really frustrated with the fact that they they don't communicate that you know some report you know do you know reporting well, some don't, but you know he really never felt like he knew you know what was going on in the business. And and I think that that's. And that's kind of when I tapped into this, this, you know, marketing as a system and all these components have to work together. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know, we're just going to grow the business and not, you know, necessarily buy tactics. Um, that I started writing about that and talking about that approach. Uh, that's kind of when blogging, you know, first took off and, uh, you know, lo and behold, a, a you know, number of other people 
uh, out there thought that was a really good idea too. And so I started getting contacted from uh, independent marketing consultants around the world uh, who um, you know, wanted to kind of take, wanted to work with small business as well and, and take that approach. And so, you know, that, that kind of led me to, I suppose, where I am, <laughs> am today. I, I, I guess I skipped the part where uh, the name came in there. I, you know, the name of my business at, at the time was not duct tape marketing. Um, it was, you know, very generic, uh, you know, Jance communications. And, uh, but I decided that, you know, if I was going to create this system, if I was going to talk about it and sell it online, it had to have more kind of brandish type of name. And that's really, you know, where I came up with it. It, it ultimately was, or, or it was uh, initially, I should say, uh, just the name of my approach. I was saying, you know, I called this duct tape marketing, but you know, it resonated so well with people that I was like, nah, I need to make this name my business and my book and my blog and my podcast and everything. So uh, uh, now I, you know, it's, uh, uh, that was 20, 20 ish years ago uh, that that uh, came about and uh, you know, we're still rocking and rolling. That's amazing. Well, let me ask you a question about this to pivot off of that idea that would you have the same business today if it was Jancy Communications? How how big of a difference did that name make that branding? Well, I think it made a I think it made a big difference in in a lot of ways. Uh, f- first, it just got me a lot of attention. I mean, I can't when blogging you know really took off, and and so now editors at major publications where go, go find me some of those blogging people that everybody's talking about, you know, my, the name of mine kind of stood out to people. <laughs> and so, you know, I had more than one you know reporter from a major publication said, I just had to know who this was, what this was all about. So, so it helped certainly in that kind of, you know, unique differentiator way. But I think it also, um, it really resonated with small business owners who, who, you know, more often than not would say, I get it. I love the name and I get, you know, kind of the metaphor of simple, effective, you know, affordable. And so I think it actually helped kind of define sort of the practical nature of, of my approach, you know, for a lot of people too. And I think if you can get that in a name, you know, that's pretty golden. I love that. And it, it just pivots into so many core lessons that I always try to share with my audience, which is the biggest sin in marketing is to be boring, right? You've got to find a way to, to capture attention, to stand out, to be memorable, and also, you really played so well into your with your answer with curiosity. Yeah. What, what is this, you know? And and there's the double meanings, and there's kind of the thought of duct tape, and oh man, putting it together, and it's just perfect fit for your audience. So if if you're advising someone in my audience right now, a coach, a consultant, a small business owner, it, it's you know a lot of them struggle with this, struggle with marketing and branding, and and how to get known and get found. Would your advice be? hey, create this kind of mission, this brand name, and, and put everything under that? Or is it better to kind of know it should be your name out front and, and trying to attract people that way? What's kind of your thought on that? I, you know, for me, and this is just my experience, I mean, I took my name off of it because I didn't really want it to be about me. I mean, it ultimately was for a long time. Um, but, you know, now we have people in my organization that, you know, that talk to a prospect, uh, convert a prospect, you know, start working with them. I mean, they never, you know, they're not looking for me. They're, they're looking for duct tape marketing. And that was really my, you know, my goal and my intention. I, you know, I believe the brand probably has uh, some value as an asset now be, be, because of that, because somebody thinks might be able to think, Oh, I don't need John, you know, to, to make, you know, this thing happen because enough people realize the values in the, in the system. So, that was certainly a lot for, for me, but I, you know, the name and the branding and that kind of stuff to me, that's, that helps cement the promise and maybe help tell helps tell the story. But I think the first and foremost, the thing that, that actually made uh, my brand take off was the point of view that marketing is a system. And that was a very unique point of view. I still, I still scratch my head today, uh, but you know, that, that that was so unique, but that, and that it starts with strategy before tactics. Um, and, and those, that, that element and sticking to that element, regardless of this new platform that came along or this new, you know, thing that was came along, I think that more than anything else is, has kind of led to the sustainability of, of, and maybe to some level, the growth of, of what I'm doing. And, and I always advise people, you know, get, come up with that point of view. What is your point of view that's unique? You know, what is your way to bring value? Who can you help the fastest, you know, that, and stick to that. Don't look for, you know, the new next new thing, you know, kind of develop uh, something that, that brings value to people that are already spending money. I love that answer. And it just reminds me of, 
you know, the biggest advantage you have in the marketplace today is you. It's your kind of approach. It's your viewpoint. It's your, the way you see the world and how you can attract other people. In your example, seeing marketing as a system, as something you can actually systematize, which, yes. which leads me to another question. Um, are there any parts of your, uh, if, if I'm coming to you as a client, are there any parts of my marketing that I cannot outsource that you would say, you cannot have someone else replicate that. That has to be you doing it. Or is everything systemized and it doesn't matter? How would you answer well, that? You know, I've always tell people, I tell business owners, don't abdicate strategy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're the only one that, that you, you may need somebody to help you articulate it, refine it, narrow it, but you're the only one who can deliver it. You're the only one who lives it. You know, you're the only, you know, a lot of times with a true small businesses, you know, the brand promises who you're being, you know, and that, that, uh, you know, that to me is something that you can't have somebody else just decide what it is, you know, because, you know, the value you bring to somebody, you know, is what they perceive it is. And so, you know, I think a lot of times, you know, that's the part where you, you, you know, first off, you have to realize how important it is, but also you can't abdicate that. There, there are elements that I think, Again, it, and it partly depends. If you're selling a $29 thing online and you just need to get a whole lot of people to buy it, you know, that's different than, you know, you are a you know, management consultant who, you know, needs to get people to trust you enough to spend $50,000 a year with you. I mean, those are two different, uh, completely different ends of the spectrum, I guess. Um, but, you know, just in ge generic general terms, uh, it's hard to outsource uh, your voice. Um, and by that, I mean the way that people connect with your emails and your newsletters and your you know, blog posts, you can get people to write them. Um, but I think that, that, you know, somebody needs to be in charge. And usually that's the business owner of, you know, how we are perceived, you know, how we are taken. I mean, are we, you know, are we salesy or are we, you know, you know, very helpful. I mean, that, you know, those kinds of things, I think somebody has to be on guard for. And then, you know, the, the one really practical one that I tell companies not to outsource is um, social media is, you know, is here as an invaluable, important, you know, marketing tool, uh, outsource the paid <laughs> part of that, you know, maybe even outsource uh, somebody posting uh, organic, uh, you know, content that kind of tells and educates your, your story. But, you can't outsource culture that is communicated through your marketing and through particularly social media. So, you know, you've, you've got to take the picture of the, the owner's new baby, you know, at, you've got to take the picture at the job site with the team. I mean, that's stuff that I don't think you can ever get somebody else to do. I love that. And it's so true because you see people, I'm glad you mentioned that it's really hard to outsource your voice. It is really hard yeah. to find a writer or someone to capture what makes you you? And I think too, the advice on social media is really helpful because you, if you get too far removed as the business owner from the day-to-day -day interaction with clients, prospects, customers, you're kind of entrusting your most valuable, you know, strategy to someone else, which is talking to people, which is yeah. asking questions, which is, are you happy? Why are you not happy? What do you like? What do you not like? This is great, great conversation, John. One more question before we pivot into talking about the latest book and sure. some of the other things that you have going on. How, when you were growing your business and your brand, and now obviously you have a team of people, how did you do that? What were the struggles that you had going from just John, the solo kind of consultant helping clients to having kind of a big company? What yes. advice would you give to a coach, a consultant who says, hey, I want to scale, I want to grow, I want to have a company, but I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to let go of things. What's, what's the advice that you would give based on what you went through with that? Well, one of the things that because... I, you know, I preach systems. Um, I, I think one of the things that I did early on, we still, you know, are relentless about is, is documenting processes, creating checklists, doing, you know, if, if, you know, if, the, if I'm going to try to transfer my knowledge and, and, and this came about in some ways because I started having people, you know, contact me, other consultants contact me and say, Hey, I want to, I want to do the duct tape marketing system too. And I was like, well, it's all in here, you know, or it's in a book. But the methodology, like how we get the work done, I mean, everybody's got like, yeah, you need a website, you need this and you need that. But how we onboard a client, you know, how we, you know, just 
discover what they need, how we do the research, all of that stuff. Um, we started uh, documenting relentlessly, partly because we kind of had to, you know, if we were going to have people buy our system, you know, they, we had to have the parts down, you know, out of my head. So I think that was probably um, something that just kind of naturally happened, but is, is a real a key ingredient. Um, the other part that I would say, and I, I tell this to consultants all the time, and certainly solopreneurs, um, it's never too early to start delegating. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we have consultants that come into our network, they're jumping out of corporate. And so they're like, Hey, I can do it all myself. I got the time, you know, I got, I got one, two clients, you know, no big deal. I'll just write all the blog posts and I'll just, you know, fix their website and I'll do everything, you know, because I can. Um, and what they realize is it's stopping them from getting more clients. And it's probably work that they can get done for a fraction of what, you know, they're worth, um, you know, doing, you know, consulting. So, you know, you get two or three clients as a, as a consultant, for example, you, you should start building a team or, you know, or in our case, you know, I have a network uh, of, of consultants and part of the value of being in that network is we've built the teams, we've built the providers, the third party resources and things. So, you know, we've, We've now transferred not only of our systems, but, you know, we've now trained people, you know, who can do the work inside our system. So, um, you know, that that element of, of, you know, it's never too soon to start looking for some best of class people uh, to delegate to. And, and, and even, you know, it kind of loops back to my first point. You can't delegate without documenting. <laughs> yes, and, and, uh, um, because that's a that's a you know, a lot of people go out and say, yeah, I'm going to get a virtual assistant. You know, and then it's like, oh, this virtual assistant's driving me crazy because he or she always wants me to tell him what to do. Um, and, you know, the, it sounds really great, right? I, I'll go out and get this person. I'll have all this help. But if you don't have a, a way to actually make them a valuable asset of your team, then they probably are going to be more of a hassle to have than, than uh, they're worth. So with you right now today, I'm fascinated to, to hear your answer to this. What are the core things that you focus on that nobody else can do with your business? What are the irreplaceable parts of John? Because you're at a place a lot of people want to be at. So mm -hmm. I'm curious to know what are the parts that you cannot delegate or what are the parts you focus on for yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that some of what we've already talked about, I mean, I try to be the, here's where we're going. I mean, I, I, we, we have evolved uh, it may not look like that to some people, but, uh, you know, we evolved, you know, dramatically five or six times, you know, over the last couple of decades. Um, and I think that that's, I see that as my role, like where we're going, you know, how we're going to evolve. Um, and then I, I, I really do think that, um, and sometimes I lose touch with this because it's a lot of work, but I really do think that I, I you know, my voice and kind of the, the content that we put out, the, the, thought leadership, if you will, you know, those are things that, that I think people look to me uh, to provide. And, and if I'm not providing those, I don't, I don't know that I have that much value. Anymore. Yeah, this is great stuff. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So I want to talk about the latest book, The Self-Reliant Entrepreneur. Why this book and why now? What, what prompted this? Sure. So yeah, it probably takes a little setup of, of what the book is. <coughs> So the subtitle is 366 Daily Meditations to Feed Your Soul and Grow Your Business. So um, if you're counting along with me, what that means is you get a page every day. A simple, you know, uh, maybe sometimes not so simple, but, you know, very, very manageable amount to read every day. It's a calendar book. So, you know, we're recording this on February 17th. So there is a page for February 17th. Every day is um, anchored with some writing. Some people will be familiar with, some won't, from mid 19th century. You know, Emerson, Thoreau, uh, Margaret Fuller, Louisa May Alcott, um, and then uh, another kind of 150 words around that theme of that day from me. And then I leave you with a challenge question. And essentially, I wrote the book that that I wanted. Um, I've you know I've I Feel like entrepreneurship is the you know greatest self development program you know ever created, um, and most you know entrepreneurs if they survive you know two three heaven knows you know twenty uh, years you know they're working on themselves as much as they're working on their business because this is you know this is hard this is this is hard mentally physically spiritually you know to do what we do it's 
incredibly rewarding as well. Uh, but I think it does take, you know, focus and intention. Um, and so one of the things that I've done for years is, is I kind of have a morning practice that, that I, you know, I meditate and, you know, try to get kind of my a journal and, you know, try to kind of get myself set for the day so that I go into the whatever I have planned that day with, with, you know, staying on course, you know, staying who I want to be. Um, and one of the, the things I've always done is kind of done some, some reading in various you know, texts, uh, just short, you know, to kind of hopefully get one idea out of it. So I wrote this book to, to kind of be my, you know, 30 years of, of experience. And, you know, I've, my five other books have been squarely on how to do stuff. Uh, this book is really more about why to do it's, it's more about the mindset uh, that I think you need so that you can, you know, do the right things uh, each day. So I, I just, you know, it's not something I woke up one day and said, I need to write this book. I, I've probably been working on it uh, for 20 years and now it's just the right time to do it. This sounds, I mean, this is exactly what everyone I talk to needs. So <laughs> we're going to, we're going to link to this everywhere. The self reliant entrepreneur, but you, uh, to quote the Jerry Maguire movie, you had me at mindset, right? Because <laughs> that is yeah. such a critical component, especially for my audience, because it is solopreneurs and coaches and consultants and you're isolated and you have imposter syndrome and no one's going to do it for you. I, I preach that to my three sons. I'm like, they're like, why are you getting up at four in the morning? I'm like, because no one's going to do it for me. I chose this route for you in your journey. And I'm sure there were setbacks and trials and tribulations. What were the kind of eye opening mindset moments, lessons, authors, techniques? I would love to know more about how you've created a mindset that has allowed you to be successful for 30 years. Sure. And, and I think some people come to it more naturally. I mean, my, my mother was the most positive. We, I, have, I have nine siblings. I mean, there were eight boys and two girls. I mean, it was, and, I, and my, my, my parents didn't, you know, have, I mean, we, we, I didn't know any better, but we, you know, we barely were getting by. Um, and, uh, you know, she just was so positive about, you know, you can't control, you know, why worry about things you can't control? Um, you know, there's, you know, going to be an answer. She was fairly religious. So it was always God was going to give us an answer. Um, but, you know, I think that that I, I think some people actually had the opposite of that. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, I will be the first to admit that I come to it pretty naturally. Um, and, and experience is a great teacher, too. I mean, you know, you early on, you're worrying about making this happen, making that not happen. And you're feeling great about you know who you are now because you made it you know <laughs> and 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 I think over over time and experience you you kind of start to realize hey there's very few things that I actually can control you know how I show up um, how I respond <laughs> to what happens those are about the only two things that are in my uh, control um, so you know you set a vision for where you want to go where you think you want to go and you let go of you know how exactly you get there um, and and again I know. I'm not the first person to say that. It's also not necessarily the easiest thing to do. Um, but I think that if, if, if anything, uh, developing that kind of level of trust, you know, is how you uh, bring, bring maybe a little uh, more joy and happiness into this thing that we get to do. I love it. I love it. And, and speaking of trust, what, what's your best advice? And I know that people can work kind of with your company directly as consultants that through your network and obviously through the different books and, and you're coming out with an online program this year, right, as well? Yeah, yeah so yep. how yep. for someone who wants to win business that's high trust, so like you said, a, a corporate consultant, management consultant, because this is something I run into when I'm teaching them how to use LinkedIn to find leads and engage and you know win five and six figure contracts. What's your best advice for those that need to win trust, starting with someone that is completely cold that you find on LinkedIn and warming them up to a five or six figure client? How, how do you go about teaching others to win trust in, in a way that's actually effective? You know, <laughs> Well, I mean, the first thing we have to realize is it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, there are, you know, a whole lot of people out there, you know, selling courses, LinkedIn's the, you know, the one that it seems like it's settled down a little bit, but I used to get three or four pitches a day uh, from people that were, you know, LinkedIn experts that were going to show me how to, you know, get a, four appointments a day, you know, that, I, you know, that may happen in some people's world, but, you know, particularly in in somebody who's not familiar with you you know trust i mean just think about any relationship that's what you're building um you know if somebody has a a 
you know, a huge need <laughs> that you can fill, you know, they are going to be motivated to, you know, to solve that problem. But we're also, you know, very leery of the mistakes we've made. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of times when people don't trust people, it's because they've been down this path, they've been burned four or five times, they, you know, bought this course, this get rich thing. And so, you know, we're, we're leery. So, you know, the way that I think that you have to be able to trust is first off, you have to be, you have to be trustworthy. <laughs> um, you know, you have to live by a set of core values that people can, you know, experience in who you're being. And, um, you know, we know, and I think sometimes what, what, what is tough for people is we know we have the solution. We know we can get you value. You know, we know this thing is awesome and you should know it too. Um, so, so that, you know, that sometimes, you know, kind of stops us from saying, no, we got to slow down. We got to, you know, take the steps. We've got to let people learn on their own. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it, it's become kind of cliche to say it, but I mean, you just got to deliver value. You know, you've, you've got to, you've got to go beyond. And, and, and the good news is the, the bar's not that high. I mean, there's so many people pitching stuff like on the first contact that, you know, you just have to go a notch or two above that uh, to stand out. And, and, you know, to me, that really starts with a genuine, um, a genuine personal interest. Um, mm. and that doesn't just mean, you know, okay, you connected with somebody. So then you write to them and say, I want to know, you know, I'd like to learn about your business. Well, do some research. <laughs> you know, you should know about their business. I mean, you should know probably what most of us had for lunch today, you know, I mean, so, you know, it, it, it's very clear, you know, when somebody's taken the time to actually intelligently learn a little bit about somebody and what they might be trying to accomplish, you know, rather than, uh, you know, sort of the mass sending of, you know, let's connect and see if there's any synergies. Right. It, this is, yeah, this is so helpful because it, it it's this great, great challenge that people have, John. And you and I grew up pre-internet and entered the world pre-internet. And I remember, you know, what it was like to kind of have to like personally connect with someone and interact and ask questions and say, oh, I see you went to KU. Man, were you there for Danny and the Miracles? And all of a sudden we're kind of getting into your story and pivoting. And now at the, with LinkedIn, I think a lot of coaches, consultants looking for lead generation, they just don't view the person on the other end of that invite as a human. And yes. it's just a number, right? Throw out 300 of these invites, maybe two will hit. That's yeah. all I want. And it's, how do you coach people though to, to, to balance that of the reality is you have to go a little deeper, but yet yeah. the consultant says, I don't want to do 15 coffee meetings a day with people that are tired kicking and aren't qualified. So how do you, sure. how do you balance that yeah. when you're reaching out for, for leads? Sure. Well, so, so the first one, and this is where I, I work with a lot of consultants that, you know, they see all these funnels and all this stuff that can be set up and they think, Oh, that's great. We can just automate the entire process. But then I ask them, well, how many clients do you really need? Well, you know, six or eight would be, you know, awesome. You know, it's like, well, why are you setting up the 2000 leads, you know, a week program then, you know, it's like maybe what you need is 10 good quality appointments you know, I mean, if you got if you got in front of ten of the right people, would six of them become clients? Oh, well, yeah, you know, right? You know, um, so <laughs> it's worth spending the time. You know, so so actually, you know, put out there what you put out there. Um, once people start to actually respond to it, you know, make them do the work. Uh, I, I don't mean that as crass, but I just mean, you know, if you don't have some sort of way to actually uh, figure out, you know, what their problem is, figure out if you're a good match for uh, solving their problem, figure out if they have the means and the desire to solve that problem, you know, then you are going to meet with tire kickers. Um, so, I mean, I've for years used a, a process when people will contact us, it's like, yeah, here's the first step, um, you know, so that we can spend uh, 30 minutes together, just completely focused on solving your problem. You know, you need to answer these questions for me. Um, and, and that, you know, for some people it's like, no, I just want the meeting. Anytime I just took the meeting, <laughs> um, it was a disaster, you know, because it was too hard, uh, to get them focused on, you know, what we think, you know, th I, I, they need. And, and I think until, until you can get people to tell you what they need, until you can get them to, you know, to tell you what, uh, solving the problem that they have, you know, would be worth. I mean, you, you are going to meet with a lot of targets. 
And this is a brilliant thing that you've done throughout your career and, and maybe not even intentionally from the beginning because it didn't exist probably when you were first publishing a lot of this, but you've really done a great job with your books, pre-qualifying people with your content so yeah. that by the time they come to you and reach out, if they've gone through your content, they are qualified. Yeah. And this is, I hired a business coach that I've had for 10 years based solely on randomly finding his book on Amazon. I liked the title. I fell into the book. Yeah. He shared a lot of great wisdom and value in the book and his personality and his you know, hero's journey. So that by the time I reached out to this individual coach, uh, I said, how much do I have to pay you? <laughs> it's very easy. And so that's what I try to teach you know, clients now with content is use content to attract and qualify. Uh, I, love, I love the direction that, that we've gone with this. So tell me more about, about the book, because I think there's, there's a lot of gold in the self-reliant entrepreneur. What are some of the kind of core takeaways or lessons that you would hope readers take out of this book? Well, I, I mean, there are some themes that come up quite often. You know, trust is one. I mean, and when, when I say that, it's self-trust, <laughs> um, curiosity, uh, experiencing things, you know, um, non-judgment. Um, you know, again, we, we waste and ex expend a tremendous amount of energy, you know, thinking that things are good and bad, people are good and bad, ideas are good and bad. Um, and, you know, that takes us, I mean, and, and, you know, all we have to do is turn to Facebook and, and you know, compare ourselves to, you know, to everybody there, um, you know, gratitude and grace um, is a repeated theme. Um, nature comes up in this book, or at least the appreciation of, of you know, our world and, and uh, you know, how great we have it. I mean, there, uh, the, you know, those are some of the, the kind of core themes that come up, you know, over and over again. Um, and I think that that, you know, a lot of times people think in terms of this idea of self-reliance, meaning, oh, I, I go it on my own, you know, and rugged individual. And, and it's really... It's really more about, you know, you probably have a unique path that, that is, is going to be, you know, uh, the way you should go. <laughs> um, and that doesn't necessarily mean a job title or, you know, it's really more about, you know, how you show up in the world and how you, you know, make an impact. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, a lot of our job is, is to figure out what that is um, and, and live that. And I think that the way that you do that is, is by experiencing things, not by, you know, sitting in a room and, trying to figure out what it is. Um, in fact, you know what I think we ought to do, John, is uh, what if I read today's? Yeah, let's do it. Um, it's pretty short, you know, to do. It takes about 90 seconds. And I think because we've been talking all about this concept of this book, but let's, uh, let's give them uh, a taste of it. So I'm just going to read today's uh, February 17th. Uh, every, um, every day has a title, has then the reading from, this happens to be from Louisa May Alcott. Um, and then uh, about 200 words from me, and then you get a challenge question. every day. So February 17th, authoring something beautiful. The whole plan laid itself smoothly out before me, and I slept no more than a night, but worked on it as busily as if my mind and body had nothing to do with one another. Up early and begun to write it all over again. The fit was on strong, and for a fortnight I hardly ate, slept, or stirred, but wrote, wrote like a thinking machine in full operation. When it was all rewritten, without copying, I found it much improved, though I'd taken out ten chapters and sacrificed many of my favorite things. But being resolved to make it simple, strong, and short, I let everything else go and hoped the book would be better for it. Mm. Actually, Louise May Alcott uh, describing how she wrote Little Women in her uh, journal. And then uh, for me, I talked a little bit about it. Norman McLean's novella, A River Runs Through It, includes a passage that captures today's reading well. One of life's quiet excitements is to stand somewhat apart from yourself and watch yourself softly becoming the author of something beautiful, even if it is only a floating ash. That is perhaps the truest description of the magic trick you must perform in order to become self-reliant, to stand somewhat apart from yourself and let go in hopes that whatever it is you're engaged in would be better for it. In the movie adaptation, there's a scene where the narrator describes how his father taught him the art of writing lay in simplicity. The son would present an essay and the father would approve and instruct his son to make it half as long. So your challenge question today, what can you remove from your journey right now in order to make it better? Oh man, that is, 
That is beautiful. And I love strong, but simple. And it reminds me of a phrase. I can't remember who said it, another author, but kill your darlings. You know, Louisa May Alcott talks about that. Like, because yes, you know, can you make it shorter and make it better? And, you know, that's just great. That's a great example of a digestible thought or tactic you can take into today. And, And thank you for sharing that, John. I think that's a brilliant way for people to get a good flavor for this book um and everyone needs to get it and we will link to it all over the place here uh in the episode but i wanted to explore also a little bit more on curiosity because Mm -hmm. you you may not remember this but i flagged this email from may 30th 2017 because i was stunned uh i saw that you purchased a 17 dollars ebook for me i think it was on webinars and i'm like oh my god i'm like total fanboy mode but i was like i can't I even know you knew who I was. Like, <laughs> what was interesting was the lesson I learned from, you wrote me back. You said, thanks, John. Always keep learning. <laughs> and I thought, this is fascinating. This is a guy, I don't know where he found me, how he heard about me. He bought one of my products uh, on webinars and it, it had no ego about it. It was just like, always keep learning. Like, where did that come from for you, that, that curiosity, and how has that served you? Well, I, you know, again, I think it's one of those things. I, I know curiosity has actually become a hot topic. It's just something that I think I was born with. You know, I told you my story about having uh, nine siblings. And so there was kind of a story in my family. And I, it's mostly myth, but you know how these stories, you know, seem to grow a life of their own. But um, the occasional time when my parents would take all 10 of us somewhere, my, my legend has it that my mom would say uh, to my father, you know, you take the other night or, or I'll take the other nine. You watch John. Um, and you know, it wasn't that I was a terror. I just, I just was insatiably curious about everything and I wanted to know how it worked and I wanted to tell people, you know, about it. So that's something I think I was just born with, but in terms of how it served me, I mean, I mean, I really think that, that I've, I I really think that I have nurtured it and, and used it as an intentional tool. Um, and, and, you know, I think the value, if I, if I bring value, um, to my audience in a lot of ways, it's because I'm looking at things that they maybe are curious about or maybe don't see, or you know, maybe all they see is the way that the public talks about uh, a tool. And I'm, you know, I've explored it, I've looked at it, I've I've pondered it, I've, you know, I've I've read books, uh, you know, completely unrelated to marketing, you know, to get uh, even better ideas and stories about how to simplify things and. Um, and that's so in terms of how it served me, I mean, it just, you know, I, I, I probably uh, give that, you know, aspect of my uh, personality is as much credit as anything, you know, for any level of success I've achieved. That's amazing. I'm so glad you shared that. That's such a great, I love when we can have a narrative to remember someone by. Now I'm always going to remember that topic of curiosity and you and your parents and like you take the other eight, I'll take him <laughs> or you take him, I'll take the other eight. That's a great analogy. So as we wrap up, what what uh, I want people to know how they can work with you, how they can find you, how they can find the book. What what are the best ways for them to connect with you, John, with your company, with your content? Take us through the options. So um, the easiest way to uh, find out more about the book is is uh, uh, it's just selfreliententrepreneur.com. Um, and you know, you, you can find more on the book, uh, as well as a lot of interviews like this that I've done, uh, related to the book appear there as well. Um, if you want to just check out what I've been doing for the last couple of decades, it's just duct tape marketing.com. Uh, and that's D U C T T A P E marketing.com. John, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure. Hey, thanks, John. <laughs>